everyone. Welcome once again to the satsang. The journey is always in. This uh, subject came to me uh, just as I was <laughs> setting up the live stream. Because we recently did a, I recently did a show with Lisa on, on um, spiritual practice. I did another one about it, the necessity of it of a teacher and there's there can be a lot of confusion and a lot of misunderstanding uh, particularly in spiritual circles but especially where the spiritual approach and the self-help approach have gotten kind of muddled you know there's this area where it's self-help it's personal development it's new age it's it's spirituality um yeah, you know, and they bring in quantum and all sorts of and all sorts of stuff, right? And so the the waters can get pretty muddied. Right? The the mo the the distinction between a genuine spiritual practice and teaching, and everything else, is that it is that nothing is acquired. In all of the practices, there are certain behavior patterns, thought patterns emotional states, vibrational states that are uh, achieved or acquired. Even meditation is often taught as there's an, a, there's the, the end game is, is to uh, have more compassion, to have uh, a quieter mind, to be able to focus and concentrate more, all of which are great qualities. But the accumulation of great qualities and a practice that is simply designed to make you a better person in any way that might be defined okay, misses the point. <laughs> the, the practice, a genuine practice of spirituality is the removal of what isn't you. It is not the acquiring of new, better behaviors, although they happen. <laughs> they will happen um, all by themselves. But they're not the end goal. They're the added stuff Christ was referring to when he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these will be. The rest will come. Okay. So then what is the, the goal? What is the goal? It is self-discovery, self-realization. Knowing yourself as you actually are. Now notice, if you know yourself as you actually are, there's no effort involved. There's nothing to acquire. <laughs> There's not really even a practice or a teaching. Right? What you are being a the, the state, the unmoving, unchanging state, it is not something that you can acquire. It's not something you can lose. It is effortless. It, it, it is... It is completely natural. There's no, there's nothing artificial added. It's GMO free, <laughs> free range, right? <laughs> it's you as you actually are, which is why it's referred to as heaven. It's referred to as this, as this place of eternal rest because the rest comes from, it's simply effortless to be yourself. So the practice, uh, the sadhana that leads to this realization can't be the accumulation of qualities, even the very best of qualities, empathy and compassion and gentleness and patience and charity, generosity. It, it can't be merely someone trying to be a better person. Because, of course, first off, we'll fail. <laughs> Nobody can maintain that. Right? And secondarily, because it's actually pushing, putting your attention away from you outward. And this is a journey that is always in. It is always away from everything external, right? Everything that is obviously not you, which is the environment around you and the people and the places. And, right? Not so obvious are the things we do, right? Those aren't really you. 
any one of us here could could do all sorts of different things. We can't do it all at once. So there's certain things we are doing. So those don't define us. That's not who you are. And getting more subtle, it's what your beliefs, your your aspirations and and desires, the the inner world of feeling and emotion. That's not you either. Those are states that can be changed, right? And you know, there's the things as you know, emo uh, releasing, right? Um, there's there's uh, different ways of altering emotional states. You know, the hypnotherapy and NLP and things like things like that. But again, all of those are changing, right? So, uh, you into a different version of you, giving you better feelings, better thoughts better ideas, pure, pure experiences. Right? But they're still one step removed. They're, you're still there looking at them. They are, while they happen, they, they seem like they're happening on the, the, this side of the skin rather than on that side of the skin, right? They are no less external to you. And when I say that, I mean that there's something looking at them, isn't there? No matter what the experience is, be it a thought or emotion, a sensation, a desire, a memory, whatever it might be, it's kind of like there's this inner screen upon which it's appearing. Can you notice that there's something looking at it? The thought doesn't think itself. We don't take the time to examine this. But this is what it means to make the journey in. I'm, I'm withdrawing for, from everything that's out there, be it on that side of my skin or this side of my skin. Anything I can perceive, anything I can look at cannot be me because I'm looking at it. And so this is the only practice that actually takes you uh, back to you. Nothing else does. Believe me, after doing this for half a century, <laughs> I've, I looked. <laughs> there isn't anything else. Everything else makes, the assum makes assumptions about who you are without a direct perception. And then starting from that wants to improve it. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because if we really discovered, you know, this, ah, this is it, why would we need to improve it? But yet we we always do. Something else comes like, oh, it's it's not that. It's oh, it's this. Oh yes, no. Oh, we shouldn't be eating the 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 salad. The new health thing is uh, deep fried fat, uh, fat and hot fudge. Ah, there's the new health secret: carrots, cucumbers. Who in the world wants that? <laughs> And this is this is the way it works. All you have to do is try to is take any health thing and type it into Google and look at the variety of, of completely contradictory information, all claiming authority, right? <laughs> all of that's well and good, right? I, I'm, I never have any objection of somebody improving their state in life, you know, in, in, you know, having a career that's more, satis more satisfying, having a relationship that's more satisfying, having more financial freedom. I never, there's nothing wrong with experiencing any of those. None of those will tell you who you are. All of those um, amplify and... Um, kind of more deeply implant the external search, the external search for some kind of perfect circumstances that are going to be, ah, this is it. Right? And not only this will be it, but it'll be permanent. It'll never change. Has anybody here ever experienced anything that stuck around? And even even the best of relationships have an ebb and flow, right? And they last only if both partners are actually pretty much on the same path, have the same interests, the, the same goals in life, 
of course, are both both of, are, are interested in discovering the reality of who they are. That's a relationship that can work. Right? It will be mutually beneficial. Right, and that search that 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 sincere sober looking will will enhance it. It, it. it will bring all sorts of wonderful wonderfulness to it. But it it's the inward journey that we must make alone that would do that right you can create a relationship that is that that supports that right and as a result it will feed back and it will feed the feed that relationship but but the goal is self realization and everybody has to make this journey within and you notice this journey within you're the only one there even the people you're most close to can't be there with you. When you're in bed at night having a dream, you may be laying next to the most wonderful person on the planet, but as far as you're concerned, they're not there. <laughs> Hell, you're not even there. <laughs> you may be a completely different char character. So it is a journey in the sense that we are we are headed somewhere right? from the perspective of our normal state, which is we are complete, highly engaged in the external circumstances and highly engaged in a particular sense of our own identity, which is what I refer to as this person that needs to be fixed, the person that needs to go on a journey. And so from there, we are going to be making a journey. It just needs to be in the right direction. <laughs> it needs to be headed inward. It needs to be headed into, into a place where we can actually get an answer to it, which means everything else is set aside. All distractions are set aside, just temporarily. You don't have to do it you know, all the time, right? You don't have to become a monk. You don't have to go live in a cave. You don't have to sit and chant Om all day. But just whenever you can, to just stop. Notice how the attention's been focused outward and, then, and, and step back. So when I say journey within or turn within, what I mean is step back from all of the things that you are experiencing, feeling, thinking, to this place that is simply aware of thoughts and feelings, sensations, desires, whatever happens to be going on. There is this place in you that is aware of that. And noticing that our sense of identity, the sense of person, is always, is always um, one that is identified with stuff that's going on. The sense of identity being, I am this person, I'm doing this and, and that. But just notice that, that all of that is simply this activity. It is simply being perceived on this screen, whether that screen is out there or in here. Noticing that, you can come all the way back to this place that is, that is aware of being, uh, being aware of all of this, is not identified with it, and it's here that the question, who am I then, gets can get asked. If it's asked any other time, the mind will answer it based on your preconceived notions, the self-image, the concepts you have of yourself, all the beliefs and assumptions and all that kind of stuff. Right? It, it will answer as that. But if all of that, those answers are recognized to be thoughts which you are seeing, then the you that's seeing them isn't being described by those thoughts. In which case it's now, oh, I am simply witnessing these. Who, who am I without the thoughts or sensations? As this pure witnessing presence, who am I? And, and don't accept any answer that doesn't come from your mind, that comes from your mind. Because right? the only answer to this must be you.
as you really are. It's the only answer. <laughs> it can't be it can't be even a derivative. It can't be a nice spiritual idea, even a great non-dual spiritual idea, even something I've said, right? It can't be that. It is the direct real realization of yourself. And on that note, I will uh, I will say hello to everyone. Start sipping up my uh, my tea. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Hello, all my dear friends. Uh, where's my cursor? I lose it. There it is. Oh my! <laughs> Long list here. Jennifer, <laughs> hello, Jennifer. Rosario in. Uh, Madrid, Brent in LA, Mary in uh, Niagara Falls, New York, Hendrik, Germany, Ava in Poland, David in LA, and greetings to both of you, Ursula in Madeira Island. Ursula, I owe you, I owe you a response to your email. I'm talking to Lisa about it, so please uh, forgive me for not getting back quicker. One, either I or Lisa will will get back get back to you on, on that. And uh, thank you very, very much for that. John in Scotland, Sue in Canada. <laughs> ah, here's somebody from the U.S. Oh, yeah, and Mary from the U.S. Paso Robles, there's Rosalind in Paso Robles. Um, it's Halifax in Canada, there's A. Um, can't get any more one than that. Carl in Ireland. Bonsoir from Andrew. Hello, Andrew. There's Lisa on the East Coast. Bill B. Hello from the Parch Santa Cruz Mountains, where it is raining heavily today for the first time since March. Oh, wow. Good to see you, Bill. And uh, wow. Whew. Yeah, well, don't get me started on that. Awesome prelude to Sad Song. Thank you, Mary. <clears throat> Lisa. Hello, Lisa. That impersonal looking is pure love, isn't it? Ah, uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. It, it is. it is. It is pure love, right? Love in its, it is the essence of what we normally think of as love, right? Now, of course, love, there's, there, there is many different ways for love to express itself as there are people, right? It's like songs and music. You never run out, right? We, we never run out of the potential for new songs that can come out of music, right? Um, love is the same way. Love, who can say what love is without referring to loving acts, right? Who can say what music is without referring to a song or, you know, you know beating out a groove or, or something, right? You simply can't. The expression and the essence are, are one. They're, they're a singularity. And so when you get to this place that is pure witnessing, right, you'll notice that all, all opinions are witnessed because they're just thoughts of uh, thought forms that arise out of certain beliefs. They're not stable. They change over time. They, they, they come and go. And they are being watched by something. Right? And if you see that, oh, so all of those opinions, my beliefs, my assumptions, my prejudices, my desires, my fears, are all vibrations of life that I'm looking at. Right? That takes me completely outside the realm of all opinions and prejudices. I'm in a place where I will allow myself to see whatever happens to be there without any judgment whatsoever. Total acceptance. That's love. That's pure love. That is the heart space. That's why Ramana Maharshi referred often to the self as the heart. <laughs> the self, uh, 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 God, true nature, pure awareness, the heart. It is this place that is pure love. And living from the place where there are no prejudices, there are no opinions, Every action is pure love, isn't it? So yes, impersonal looking is pure love. But notice that impersonal looking, it doesn't have a particular characteristic about it, yet all characteristics 
can express it. You can see it in what expresses it. You can't see it directly, like yourself. You can see your eyes in the mirror, but you can't see them. <laughs> you can see your face in the mirror and on the video or something, but you can't see your face. As far as you're concerned, you don't have one. <laughs> That's not your actual experience. Right? But So it, love is like that. You can't see it directly. You know it when you, but you see it indirectly in its reflection all, all around you. But here's the important thing that I want to bring your attention to. The impersonal looking is pure love, right? Is that different from you? Is this pure love something other than the one who's doing the looking? Oh, please get that. <laughs> you are that pure love. <laughs> it is not a state. It is not something that happens to be there with you. Right? Because if it was, it'd be something you would be witnessing, something else you would be seeing. This, this is the journey to, to get to the you, right? Not anything other than you. And so if that impersonal looking is pure love, that pure love must be you. Now, Keep looking at that which the word pure love expresses. And don't let it, don't, it's very subtle how we can get engaged with the word pure love and, and suddenly give it a shape, give it a form, give it a character, give it an identity. It's a word pointing at something beyond all words. And that something is you. <laughs> Thank you for that, Lisa. Help me uh, round out the the opening uh, the opening thing. Amy, so good to see you. So good to see you. You're back in Vegas. Brent, hey, Brother G. Can you speak more on the original discontent that leads to searching? Lately, I find my career so unfulfilling. But instead of searching for a new job, I've taken my hands off the wheel and I've just been remaining as the witness to to this anxiety of missing out on life somehow. Yeah, the FOMA syndrome. As if some job or experience could satiate this. Eternally grateful for you, yeah, as I am for you. Yes. Life, life is life. Lived from the point of view of a personal identity, I am this body, I am this mind, I am these beliefs, where that sense of I has gotten all mixed up and bound together, stewed into this stew, and we call that the person or the egoic mind. Um, Buddha just put it as clearly as he possibly could. This is dukkha, this is suffering, right? Now, when he used that word suffering and that, that word, the word uh, dukkha, it's got, it's, it's got some really nice um, um, nuances to it, right? But in this particular case, I, I want to point that he, he pointed out that it wasn't, it wasn't the extreme suffering necessarily. That, that's, that's it too, right? Just total deprivation and, and you know, pain and things like that. But it was, but it was a subtle discontent, right? simply not being content. Now, the nature of the egoic uh, sense of person, its nature is discontent. <laughs> it cannot be content because it is unstable. It is always shifting. Everything it reaches for vaporizes in its hand. Maybe not immediately, but eventually it will. There's just this innate discontent that is the suffering um, that Buddha was referring to. That is that is that it, especially now in the West is distracted from. It's pushed aside. It's it's tried to you know visualize it away, um, thinking that somehow we can create a version of ourselves, a 
a different uh, egoic mind that is free from this discontent. And for a while, that can do it in the sense that um, when we get what we want, when our minds are made, I want to have this and I get it, there's an emotional high that takes place, right? Inevitably. And, and that emotional high will temporarily mask the discontent. And we think, this is it. Boy, I, I've got it now. I've got that car. I got the relationship. I got that job. Got this thing. Okay. But eventually, as all things are impermanent, <laughs> it's going to shift. A new desire is going to arise. Or this one's going to just kind of get old. It's not going to be that interesting at all. I don't know why this thing is. Um, keeps kind of pushing me in and out of focus. Didn't used to do that. Now, oftentimes our, our spiritual journey uh, will involve experiencing that discontent. The, the journey as it starts for, for everybody, first off, that, that discontent was just completely ignored for hundreds, thousands of years, right? It's just, that's it. That's what life is like, you know, tough luck. It, it, recently, last hundred years or so, our our ambitions have gotten more. There's this idea that well, maybe we don't have to experience that, and the you know the consciousness movement, uh, uh, self help, and and um, and and all of that metaphysics, law of attraction, all got all started getting higher ambitions about well maybe I can be satisfied, right? And so, but the attention then went outward to what are the circumstances that I could create that would satisfy this, and that's perfectly reasonable because that's what we've always done. I have a desire. I try to get it fulfilled. If I can, then I feel that, then the discontent I don't feel anymore. But it's still there, <laughs> but you're not feeling it now. Right? It's been masked over by these other more, more, more loud uh, emotions. Right? But then <clears throat> either because somebody has just begun to wake up a bit or They've tried a million things and nothing's working. They're working and they're wondering what maybe there's more to this than I thought. And then somehow, sometime, at some point, it's like this discontent is here. I haven't done anything to get, get away from it. Is this just the nature of life? I have to deal, you know, I have to deal with the discontent. That's it. Or have I been looking in the wrong place? Is there an actual way out of it? And that's the opening. Now, when that happens, you're on the path. <laughs> you have embarked on the spiritual path. Prior to that, you've been kind of, kind of uh, dancing around at the starting line, running off to some place and running back, running some place, running up, and coming, coming back. And at some point, it it, it becomes this the search in earnest because you realize nothing else is working. It, it you know it's not even that I'm so smart I figured it out. It's just like look, it didn't work. <laughs> I, I tried and. It didn't work. So at that point, as you're turning within, everything is going to start changing. Your values are going to shift. The things that you care about, the things that did bring satisfaction before aren't going to bring satisfaction anymore. And there can be this tendency, you know, I, I got I to get out of this relationship. I got to get out of this job. I got to get, get, get out of this thing. And it's possible you may need to, right? But if, if the discontent is, discontent is driving that to happen, it will simply be a, you know, you'll just be uh, basically rearranging the, the deck chairs on the a Titanic. It, it's, it, it, it will be a temporary relief. And so when you realize that, you've come to a level of spiritual maturity where you're going, okay, I do really want to change this. It isn't satisfying. But there's something that's more important to me. And I don't want to just do another, you know, just a, a, another rearrangement of the jack, deck chairs. I, I want to find that which is truly satisfying. And I have this intuit, intuition that it doesn't really matter what's happening out here. Right? At least not fundamentally. And if I do find this discontent, find the source of this, and 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 find then the actual the actual contentment 
that I've, I've really been seeking, first off, I'll be content. The job won't matter anymore. If I have it or not, I'm content. I won't look for that anymore. And at the same time, opportunities and things that, that, give, that give expression to that contentment will inevitably show up because this will manifest it, itself. But it needs to be found on its own terms. And it can't be diluted thinking that, okay, I just need to do this instead. Um, if I do this, then it'll be okay. That can be quite a distraction. But you've gotten to the point of maturity where it's like, I've got to, this has got to be the priority to, 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 to turning with him. And so, yeah, you kind of take your hands off the wheel, right? You start, you start letting go, and that's what I mean by letting go. Just really take your hands off and, and begin to just watch the feelings. Watch that, you know, the discontent with the job may be an expectation that hasn't been fulfilled, some desire, right? And just notice that. You, you don't even have to try to get rid of them because you can't. You just, you just become aware of them, right? You see these motions, these energies, these vibrations going on inside us, and you step back into that position as the witness of it, asking the same question. All right, these are all going on. Right? Are those who I am? Or am I this that is aware of it? And it, it can be challenging because there's all sorts of impulses in us. We have all all sorts of habits, all sorts of ways in which we have dealt with discontent before that have become automatic. And so we immediately, the, the impulse, the habitual impulse is to, is to start doing those things that we would have done before. And so you feel that, but you don't do it. And it's a very uncomfortable place to be, but, you, but that gives you the space to go, well, these are just habitual patterns that are, that are, that are coming up yet again okay, are they essentially who I am? This doesn't mean, right, okay, I, I'm just going to, you know, this job sucks, I'm going to just uh, endure it. It's not resignation. It, it's, a, it's a looking into the depths of the whole mechanism by which discontent emerges. And, and you, you can see at this point <laughs> that that emerging of the discontent is actually an extremely valuable <laughs> and and benevolent happening because if i wasn't i would just be i'd just be acting out blindly i would i would just be un, an unconscious automaton and yeah, i don't like it go somewhere else but the fact that i turn towards the discontent to find its essence with the desire to go beyond discontent to that which is eternally content recognizing that it isn't out there, it is in here, well, then you realize that the discontent has been your best friend. It has been the, the step on the path. It's that discontent that drove Siddhartha to become the Buddha. He had a totally easy life, right? Everything he wanted, he was a prince for crying out loud. Everything he wanted, servants, and he had a great relationship. He and his wife loved each other deeply. He got really exposed, deeply exposed to suffering. I just ate at him. He couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't stand it anymore, and he left. He left in the middle of the night and, um, and just put himself through all sorts of austerities until he had found the answer to suffering, which is that, uh, that discontent, which is identification with thought and emotion and sensation and beliefs and all the other, the, the, the creation in the mind of a fictitious person that we then try to improve. So your mind will keep coming back and say, okay, yeah, this is good. This is great. Keep doing this, but man, can we get another job? I don't like this job. And, and that's okay. Just notice that that's what it's going to do. And if something does pop up that's an improvement, take it, right? But don't turn that into the quest. Notice that it, it's a sideshow, right? And, and, you're, and, and you're in the main tent, right? And it'd be great. Something comes up, something improves in my life, great. I'm in. I'll take it. But it's never going to be the ultimate answer that I'm, that I'm seeking. 
How's that, Brent? I think I may have just strayed off a little bit, but I'm kind of wandering today. Hello, Patricia. Good to see you. Hello, Carl. GP, can conditioning come up as physical ailments? Absolutely. I hurt my back last week, and loads of old inner injuries have come back to haunt me. All at the same time. Do I just observe these? I feel like a guinea pig to my mind at the moment. It's unusual for me to have so much physical stuff going on together. Thank you. It's quite all right. Uh, it's quite all right. Um, well, first off, uh, I always make sure, because this is not a medical program, right? I'm not a doctor, that when something comes up, the, you know, the, the symptoms can be alarming, then have it checked out. Right? I just did. I've just gone through all sorts of tests, right? They found absolutely nothing wrong, right? Um, matter of fact, he said, you should be very proud of that brain. <laughs> you don't have the brain of a 70-year-old. So, but there were, there were some uh, symptoms that could have been, you know, a precursor to something. And I said, well, I better check it out. I better, I, I better check it out, which I did. Right? So it's important to do that. Right? It's very important to do that so that you, you rule that kind of stuff out and, and you don't make um, a spiritual inquiry into some kind of avoidance thing. Right? Now, that saying, it is absolutely... Um, it's absolutely true that deep traumatic material conditioning stuff coming to the surface can appear in the body as physical conditions. Now, this is not just some kind of abstract metaphysical thing. This is something that has been clearly demonstrated. It has not made it into the mainstream of, um, of the medical community, but, but it is, I mean... These are studies that have been do done and published, you know, <laughs> double-bind studies published in the prestigious journals were real stuff with peer review and the whole deal, that there is a direct correlation between early childhood trauma and even the most severe of illnesses. So the, the effect of these things on the body is extremely, is extremely real. Now, this approach that we take here to it, if you've ruled out any kind of physical um, uh, thing happening, then you look at it simply as something that is arising. And you observe those, but also observe your emotional reaction to it. Ob observe the emotional environment in which, which, in which it's happening. And, and you, can, you can be with it. You can use something like tapping to, um, to, to help the, the, the body relax into it, to kind of, kind of just kind of sink into that feeling of, of safety. So, it, so it's not, you know, panicking about something that's, that's, that's gone wrong. And you can also do, you can inquire into it, right? Um, in sessions with people and in group stuff that I've, I've done, and I haven't done a live class in quite a while because of all this other stuff that's been going on, but we'll actually have a conversation with it. Right. If there's a particular painful thing coming up, just kind of put your hand on it and say, "Well, okay, what? Why are you here? What do you need from me?" Right. D open up this kind of like dialogue with the energy as it's moving. Right. Saying, "What can I do to help?" Right. What do you need? Right. I I know you want to release yourself. The body does not want to be in this state. I recognize that it has been holding that state for a long time to, to keep this energy of the, the trauma suppressed. We now have a safe enough place for it to release itself. What do you need? Right? You've, you've come up, right? And everything comes up on its way out, right? And it will be on its way out, right? That is the body just kind of discharging that, that energy. Unless we do something to keep it there by intimidating it, by creating an environment that isn't safe by, by, um, uh, by reframing, do all the things you do to try to suppress that energy. So instead, you're being, you're, you are doing everything to be present with it. 
recognizing that there's also a natural resistance to feeling pain. Of course, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to feel that. And acknowledge that as, as well, right? To acknowledging that I want to resist it. What I really want is to go away, but it's not. All right, so I can't help it if I just keep telling it to go away, right? That doesn't work. If somebody tells you to just go away, you, you, you can't do much for them, right? So you'd sit and say, okay, why are you here? What are you protecting me from? What is this? What is this about? And become curious about the stuff that's going on inside of you. See, notice this doesn't have to be some kind of a non-dual, right? The body doesn't exist. It's all in the mind. It, anything like that, even though ultimately that is true. In very practical terms, I find that people taking that approach are, are usually trying to do an end run. They're doing a spiritual bypass and not actually being fully present. Because if that's all true and it's just all energetic patterns, then I can be with them without fear. Right? And, and this is the real gift that I, that. I, that the inward journey uh, that uh, gives you. This is the wake on the boat, right? Nobody gets into a boat to make a wake. You get into a boat to go somewhere and the wake is a byproduct. So this journey inward is going to open up space as you're disidentifying with everything you thought you were. It's going to open up space and old stuff and deep stuff and stuff from past lives is going to come to the surface. Just don't, just don't re-identify. Um, notice the, the habit of wanting to resist it or suppress it. And, ah, thank you. I see that now. And disidentify from that. Notice that you are witnessing that as well. And just do everything you can to come back to this place of the loving witness. I call it the peacemaker. Right? So you have no issue with whatever the body is doing. Right? And... This kind of opens up a space that whatever pain is there that is purely psychological, purely coming from resistance, it will dissipate very quickly. And what's remain, what remains will be something, some place in you that needs even more love. Because <laughs> remember, this is self, this kind of love is, is self accepting. It accepts the fact that it's there, and it's there for a reason, and, and inquires into the reason rather than just wishing for it to go away, right? That's genuine love. That's the pure love of the witnessing. Yeah. Does that help, Carl? <clears throat> You'll tell me if it doesn't. Hey, <laughs> <clears throat> how to create a better relationship with one's thoughts, G. I know I am not my thoughts, mind. However, I, I always wonder how the Buddha obtained his knowledge without thinking. Um, great question. Great question. Because the knowledge that he attained was beyond thought. It was not our discursive kind of knowledge that we think of, which is really just descriptive, right? You're defining one thing in terms of something else, describing things, you're comparing things, right? And that works for things. You know, I can I can describe the microphone, I can describe a little, you know, the pad I have here, right? The trackpad I have here. I can describe the, I can describe these things, right? Because I'm I'm separate from them. I'm looking at them. And I so I can describe them. Of course, my description will be limited and biased because it's only limited by what I can perceive with my senses and, and conceive of in the mind, right? So, but I can do that, right? And that is what is regarded as knowledge, right? And the better we get it, we try to get past our perceptions so we, we're, we're clear about what we're actually seeing, but it's, but it's a subject-object relationship. And the knowing of something, right, is that is its attributes. This is what it is. And I can tell you in words what it is. Well, where does that, what happens to that, uh, that mechanism of knowing or knowledge when you can't look at the thing that you're trying to know? You can't. <laughs> and you cannot look at yourself, can you? You cannot stand aloof from yourself and then describe yourself. 
you, you can't do it. You, so you, it's a different kind of knowing. You, the, the, that's the inward journey where you're withdrawing from all of the normal knowledge that we associate with ourselves, which are just the, the thoughts, uh, our language, so feelings, descriptions, comparisons, and, and all of that. Because all of those don't apply to the non-dual inquiry. I can't apply that to myself. So I step away from the mind. Right? Now, if I recognize that the mind is a functioning of life, that's functioning according to the way it was developed and conditioning and the environment was in and the knowledge that it was fed, and then I'm looking at it, I have just determined the best relationship with the mind that there is. I let it be what it is, but I don't believe it's me. And, I, and so I don't buy its version of knowledge <laughs> when it tries to apply it to me because the mechanism of that knowing doesn't work. I cannot know myself as one thing knows another. I must know myself directly, non-phenomenally, non-dually. Right? That's what, what non-duality is. It is, the, it is knowing without it being two things. <laughs> the non-dual self-inquiry is inquiring into myself directly, not as something looking at something else. That's it. That's non-dual self-inquiry in, in a nutshell. And so recognizing the mind as just a functioning, right? It's a natural functioning. It's been going on. And it's only become a problem because I was so identified with it. I thought everything it was thinking applied to me. Well, it doesn't. It only applies to an object in the mind, which you can look at, right? So I can look at an image of me and I can describe it. But that's not me. <laughs> it's just an image, right? And we can be very inaccurate about it. It's like describing myself in the mirror. I can describe it perfectly, right? But it's not me. <laughs> it may be a resemblance, but it's not me. What is this me, this, this true knowing, right? This is the knowledge, the real knowledge, Vedantic knowing or jnana knowing, which is, a, which is a, another Sanskrit word for that, this kind of knowledge, right? That's what he saw. He saw himself as he was, pure being, with nothing extra added. I just am. And that gave him access to the criteria by which all other knowledge could be assessed. All other knowledge would be relative, right? To the perspective, to the point of, uh, point of view, to the place you're standing, to the to the mechanism through which you're perceiving it, the senses or the instrumental extensions that science uses, right? All of those are going to be relative to a perspective. This isn't, right? This is direct knowledge that is not relative to anything other than itself. So this knowledge gives, gives authority to assess and discriminate the, the quality and character of all relative knowledge, because it's absolute. It is what I am, not how I appear. So the right relationship with your mind is to let it be what it is. Right? When we say that, we, we, I, you, you can sense that there's something that's troubled. Somehow I want the mind to shut up or agree with me or, <laughs> or tell me something nice for a change, right? <laughs> that you can see that there's some kind of subtle disagreement with it. Well, it doesn't do any good to it. You might as well disagree with Siri. Right? Siri, I, I, I don't like the sound of your voice. I'm sorry. I don't really care, right? There's no I there. There's nobody there. It's just a functioning, right? The I is simply a, the functioning of thought. Thought doesn't think itself. It is not self-aware. You are. And so it appears to you. So whatever appears to you isn't you, nor is it talking about you. It can't. It can't see you because you're not an object. So just let the mind be the mind. And when you do that, you'll find the mind just kind of gets quiet. 
the, the, the flow of thoughts just kind of slows down, right? Simply because they're not being energized by your attention, by either an attachment to a thought or an aversion to it. Right? It's just, oh, this is just the functioning. That's what it is. But who am I? The one looking at it. The one who sees this functioning. Who sees all knowledge. Hmm, what am I? And just notice that there's a knowing there. You know that you are, but it's not a knowing, right, that because somebody told you or somebody described you, right, you just know you are. That's a direct knowing, isn't it? And, and there's the difference. That's Vedantic knowledge, right? Or jnana, wisdom. Does that do it for you, eh? <laughs> um, Igle, oh, so good to see you. I wish I could pronounce your last name. <laughs> I'm not even going to try. Too many little dashes and things there. Hello, Donna in Colorado. Well, 1121 comments. Yeah, oh, not bad. There's John in Ireland. Bill B, huge upheaval in my life and responsibility for possessions feels like a burden. Many of my things are useful or beautiful. And besides, I don't want to join the throwaway economy. How to balance. Um, well, it's a, that's a big one, you know. And I, and I took kind of the, the radical, you know, wandering sage approach what, seven years ago now, the middle uh, summer of 2015, where I did, I did sell everything I had. I did it again when I went off to Germany for, for, for three months. Um, things that I really did love, things that I really cared about. Uh, ev everything, the stuff that we love, the stuff that are useful, the, the, the stuff that are, are, are beautiful, are all transient and temporary. Nothing is, for, nothing is forever. That doesn't discount their value to you. It simply means that what do you value more? Right? So you, there's no need to find a balance, There's right? It's a flow. It's not a balance. In a balance, nothing's happening. This is, this is a flow, right? And so when there's an upheaval in your life right, and things feel like a burden, right, go into the feeling of being burdened rather than into the, the things that appear to be creating the burden, right? Because let, let's face it, any, the possession, if a possession is burdensome, everybody who has that possession, whoever could touch that possession would feel burdened, right? But obviously they don't. Right? One person can rejoice in it for a while, right? Where somebody else says, oh, God, I really? I don't want that. You know, some people would uh, think having, you know, a, a 10,000 square foot house is the most wonderful thing in the world. I see it as a huge burden. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, <laughs> I have a one bedroom apartment and I don't want to clean that. <laughs> right? So, But it has nothing to do, right? Somebody else could feel burdened by this or uh, squashed or something. So then where's the feeling of burden coming from? It's not coming from the things. It is the sense of self that feels burdened. And I'd go even so far as to say that you, the sense I am, is feeling burdened by the sense of self. Because the egoic identity is burdensome. It's heavy. It requires so much energy to maintain. So go deeply into that feeling of being burdened, into the feeling itself, putting aside all the assumptions about, about what is causing the burden and even who is burdened. And, and just ask deeply, where is this sense of being burdened come from? Can I not be free from this unless I, I throw everything out and make a, a completely new life and just detach from everything. Right? Is, is, if that's the case, then I'm, 
My freedom is completely dependent upon these. Freedom must be more innate than that. There must be a way to, to, to know freedom without. I mean, by definition, freedom is free, right? <laughs> if it depends on something else, it's not free, right? It, it must be self-existent. So then where's this sense of burdensome come from? And you can start letting go of all the places that you thought it was coming from, these things, because it's not that, right? And if I feel like I have to have them, it's a burden. If I feel like I, I got to get rid of them, it's a burden. All right, so it's not the things. Where's this actually coming from? And, and that doesn't mean you may not just chuck it all and, you know, and go off somewhere and say, screw it, go completely off grid or something. You might. I, I just want that to come out of the, the, the deep seeing and not be a reaction in an attempt to to, to make adjustments to things, to try to create something which you're, which you're going to find in, in the probably not too distant future is also becomes a burden, right? Because maintaining something will become a burden, which means the only thing that isn't a burden, burden is something that doesn't need to be maintained, that is self-existent and effortless. And what's that? You, the real you is effortless. It does not take anything to be who you are. It takes an enormous amount to be who you're not. And so at that point, if something is, it's time for something to go, it, it, it probably, you don't need to throw it out. There's probably somebody else who can use it or buy it or, you know, some, some place where it would really, it would really be appreciated. Last time I did that, I, I went to the, uh, the Salvation Army. I couldn't believe how grateful they were. I've left stuff at other places, and it was like, yeah, thanks, put it over there. Um, but I, th at least this one place I went to, oh, they were so, this is great. We can make, oh, yes. They were just like, ah, oh, wonderful. They, they knew there was a need for it, right? Um, so let me see if I've covered everything you said. Right? So appreciate the beauty and utility of all things because they're not the source of the burden. Right? And when you are unburdened, they won't be a burden. They also won't be an attachment. You'll love them while they were there, while they're there. And when it's time for them to go to somebody else, they'll go. So um, take the upheaval in your life as an invitation to go deep into this sense of being burdened. Yeah. And find the one who is burdened, you will find, is not who you really are. And both the burden and the one who is burdened will both dissolve. Thank you, Bill B. Lisa, I looked a few days ago again, very intensely, after myself. And then, when there was just a no thing. There was so much laughing again, tears running from laughter, but still a sense of I ego remains. But it's okay. Yes, it will remain. Of course, it's going to remain, right? You're not going to become a zombie, right? The, the, it, it's, the ego stops being you and just becomes a functioning, right? It, uh, the sense of identity comes and goes. There's a, a function I've taught it in depth in a lot of my one of my courses that happens very naturally and it's called the storyteller mind it's always making up stories about things and the main story it's always making up is the sense of identity right if you realize that that's what's going to happen and that the sense of i will always be there until it's not you're no longer a slave to it and remember the the ego is not the thing. It is not the actual formations, the patterns of thought itself. Those are just what happened. They're conditioning they're the, and the natural functioning of the, the whole energy, energy system. When the sense I am identifies itself with the ego, with the functioning, I am this functioning, in that moment, 
the imaginary ego comes into existence. Prior to that, it doesn't. It's, it's a thought that I am what I am experiencing. What I'm experiencing is there. It's the mirage in the desert. The desert is there. And so is the heat and the sand and the thirst and all of that is there. But the mirage isn't. That's the projection of the mind. So when the mirage is gone, does that mean the sand's gone, the, the sun's gone, my thirst is gone? No, it, it just means the illusion that got projected on what in fact is a natural functioning is gone, right? And that seeing it, oh, I'm no thing at all, is the seeing yourself as you are, not as an, as an, as a, as a, as an ego. The ego's gone, right? It never really existed. This is what you are. So that sense of identity is there. Now, from here, you'll notice that the functioning is still going on. You're still breathing, right? I'm, I, I'm assuming you're still eating food and taking showers and walking around and doing stuff. The functioning, there's not, the functioning is innocent, right? And the functioning will actually fun, function better when it is not limited and constricted by this sense of who I am. Now, that sense of I, take some time and just be present with it as the witness even of that. If I can witness it, it isn't essentially me. So even the sense I am, right, which is the first vibration, its own, right? It is the firstborn, right? That sense I am is what identifies with the body, mind, and gives rise to what we call the ego. Okay? Notice that that being redeemed from that, the sense of I begins to come back home to that no thing. That no thing that does exist. Right? It's not nothing. Right? It, it, it just, it's just me. Right? Ponder that. It's just me. Nothing else added. No thing except me. And I'm not a thing. I am here. <laughs> I exist. But not as anything. I just am. And everything else then can take their, its proper place within this <sighs> extraordinary I am-ness, that everything that you experience draws its being from that I am-ness, and that you remain beyond even that, is the absolute witnessing even the arising of the I am, which is the creation of the universe. And with it, all the gods and men and space and time, and all of it is the I am, witnessed by that which is beyond all of it, the true self, the real you, the Buddha, Nirvana. Great question. <laughs> great, great question. Oh, so fun to go there. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> that was well, it was fun for me. <laughs> Hello, Barbara. Brent, viewing the discontentment as a friend. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> yes. We immediately think I've got to get rid of the discontent, right? <clears throat> the discontent's a problem. Is it? <laughs> you know. If you cut yourself and you feel pain, is that the problem? No, it's not. It's the, hello, you know, it's the idiot light on the dashboard going, you're two quarts low, Jack. <laughs> but we, we live in this time. I don't want to feel these things. I, always, I see only sunny days, smiley faces on everything. You know, the whole law of attraction nonsense, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Stante, Chedante, nice flowers. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, I got the, I saw these sunflowers today as I was picking up some stuff at the grocery store. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Must, I must have them. <laughs> Everybody loved them. Very good sense. Do you know, do you know the meaning of effect? 
acknowledge the energy, charge free of meaning, no reflection. A little, let's see, sense, very good, sense? Sensei, <laughs> sensei, I'm sorry, I didn't see the eye. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's quite an honor to be called a, a, a sensei. Some called me a sifu, even a couple of people called me Kyoshi. Um, very honoring, thank you. Do you know the, the meaning of effect? Acknowledge the energy, charge free of meaning. Yeah, yeah, it's just acknowledge it. You see it, right? Um, charge free of meaning. Now, how do, you, how do you actually take the meaning away from something? Well, you have to see that the meaning was never in the thing. It was always in the perceiver of the thing. In which case then, now, we get stuck because we think this is the meaning of it, and the meaning I gave it didn't come from me. It's what it is, right? When you realize it isn't, that it's just your perception, everything loosens up. <laughs> everything becomes easier. It's like, oh, it's just my perception. And there's an openness now that allows you to see what's actually there and not just your perception of it. And, and in so doing, it loses its charge. It also empowers you because, oh my God, my whole world is nothing but what I think it is, all the meaning of it, all the suffering, all of it is, is simply the meaning I gave it. It doesn't have any. There's no suffering in life. I project suffering onto it. <laughs> and, and so, yeah. And so you get deep into, oh, wow, I'm projecting on it. The meaning I gave it, I'm really powerful. So if I'm giving everything its meaning, hmm, I think a good idea would be to know what's true. So I'm just not hopping from one temporary meaning to another, what's really true? And of course, remember, that which we have given the most sticky meaning is ourselves. The image we hold of ourselves is also meaning we have projected on it. And so this image you hold of yourself doesn't possess any of the qualities you think it does. So, oh, well then, who am I? The source of all these projections. And these projections, well, they must, my God, they must be here. They must be coming from me. So whatever meaning I give it is actually my meaning. It's what I mean. Oh my goodness, who am I? Get you right back there. <laughs> right back, right back home to the to that the journey is always in. It doesn't matter how far you roam. <laughs> you always come back here. <clears throat> Isabel. Oh, Carl, much love and gratitude for the verbal back massage. <laughs> Guru of many talents. <laughs> you're, you're welcome, Carl. Isabel, hello from Portugal. Hello to you. Now, soon in the USA again. Well, welcome. Dante, again, function versus recognizing spirit. Yes. Recog that which recognizes functioning as functioning without identity is the spirit. That's just another name for the self or for God or for, or for Buddha nature right? or for the heart or for the nothingness, shunyata, emptiness. Right? The functioning is actually the functioning of the nothingness, right? The, the, the total emptiness of being gives rise to the infinite variety and variations of form. So the two are actually one, right? Like music and the song. You can't separate them. Uh, Ibala, Ibala, Ibala. Hi, GP. Every, greeting from Holland. Hello. Is my conclusion that freedom for everybody has a different meaning? Yes, obviously it does. You know, it's got a completely different meaning. So just assume that your the meaning you give it is the meaning you've given it, right? But what that means is that the, the meaning that you have assigned to freedom, the meaning you give it, you will be bound by that meaning. 
if I think this is what it is and it isn't that, then I'm kind of stuck in that little bubble of meaning that I've given it. But if I realize it's, I've given it that meaning and I could give it any meaning at all, it means that there's actually no limit to what freedom is, which means that there's an infinite freedom available to me right now. I just don't want to put it by just simply not putting in a bubble. Because I look at this and there's that freedom and there's that freedom and there's that freedom and there's that freedom. And I'm aware of all of those. And I personally have chosen this one. I, okay, well, that's just another opinion, right? So I withdraw that and it's like, oh, I can see all these different forms of freedom. What is freedom? Well, it's obviously beyond all form. And that there's an infinite number of ways of manifesting freedom. And because I'm capable of manifesting all of those, freedom is what I am. It's not an attribute of me. It's not something that comes and goes. It's what I am. I am freedom. I am the very essence of everything I'm projecting. I have to be. If I'm giving that a meaning, the meaning that I'm giving it isn't in what I'm giving it to. It's in me, and I'm giving it to it. I'm projecting it. Hmm. Maybe I ought to pay more attention to the projector, right? The journey is always within. <laughs> so, so, and noticing that, oh, wow, everybody has a different meaning for it. So freedom, then what is the actual meaning of freedom, right? Is there some definition of freedom that I can put in a box? Well, no, it can't be. It's just going to be another perce perception. So what is it? Where does it? Oh, my. It's got to be so unlimited that it can't be put into words or sh a shape. And I'm aware even of that. Hmm. It's me. I am that love. I am that freedom. I am that joy. I am that wisdom. They're, they're, not, they're not concomitants of me. They're not attributes of me. Right? They're not separate from me. In a sense, they're kind of the, per, the perfume of me because I can talk about love and I can talk about uh, truth and I can talk about wisdom and I can talk about meaning and I can talk about freedom. I can talk about all of these. I can see every different form of them. All of those are kind of a, 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 an I amness. All of those are a perfume of me that cannot be defined at all. No word, no concept, nothing can capture it. I give rise even to the most fundamental things like music or love or even those are just a manifestation of my, my boundless, inscrutable nature. This is the self. This is nirvana. This is heaven. Thank you, Ebola. Ebolia. Did I say that correct? Bill B. Ah, neither the feeling of burden nor its absence comes from the processions. Beautiful. Thank you, G. Great. You got it. Opened up. Yes. Boom. That lens just opened up. Ah, none of it's coming from there. Yes. They're all, they're all the manifestation of you. And you can get to see that so clearly. It's like, oh, wow. It's all me. Who I better know who I am because it's all me. I better take some time and find out who the hell this is. <laughs> uh, Dante says, awesome. Awesome back to you. Mary Sykes, GP, may I ask what your thoughts are of Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now? I love that book. I think it's wonderful. It's a great book. It's a, it's a marvelous book. As, and how he's managed to... Um, uh, I mean, it's what I try to do. It, it's to try to take the the uh, utter non dual, pure non dual understanding, and reduce it down to a level that can be understood. Right? He talks about the pain body. I talk about conditioning. I call it the robot. Right? You know, the the Siri inside that's just the voice. You know, the pain body. He's used different analogies from it. So this it's it's a great book. 
He deserves all the credit he's been, been, been given. So many people have been introduced to this path through that. And he's just a delightful human being on top of it. I mean, he's just, you know, he's just kind of dry, <laughs> right? Sense of humor. And then he gets that little, that, that, that little, that little giggle. And it's just, I mean, there's just nothing unlikable about, <laughs> about him. And that's somebody who, who endured, he was 29 years old when, when that awakening took place. And his entire life, he just suffered miserably. He hated his life. He hated himself. And I mean, that was the, the moment when, when he says, I just can't stand myself. And something went, wait a minute. There's how many of us are here? What is this that I can't, who's this I and this one that I can't stand? And suddenly the whole thing, the whole structure just collapsed. He saw it was a duality that he, he was identified with that one that he hated that he couldn't stand, and then just noticing that he was looking at the thing he couldn't stand, and the identification vaporized. And he woke up. Um, and, you know, it was another, I think it was another 20 years before he actually wrote The Power of Now. I think that's about that's about right. Um, and Because he had just sat on that park bench for a while. Um, he was just really just enjoying his freedom. Um, he consulted with people one on one for a while. He would do like little groups and stuff like that, and then just one day, he just decided maybe this should be bigger. And it was like, um, and it was a while though, even after after that, that the idea to write the book happened. And it was another seven years before he actually got wrote the book and and it got published. So um, it's it's marvelous. He's uh, you know he's awakened awakened being that has found his particular mode of expressing it that's blessed a whole lot of people. So, yeah, yeah, it's a good book. <laughs> good book. I can see why you love it. Uh, Anthony, <clears throat> before you go, G, I'm not going anywhere for a while. <laughs> I'll let you know something I don't. <laughs> What's the importance of meditation? Is it really required? My understanding is that Rama was not very fond of it. Um, yeah. Meditation as a discipline, as a practice, as something that's done, again, it's a tool in the toolbox that if you misunderstand what the objective is, you, you will it will turn into a technique basically for self-improvement, improvement of concentration, and, and the like. You know, when I invite somebody, when I invite you, like in, in the beginning I talked about just withdrawing your attention first from all the external world, right? All the normal obligations and stuff we have. You start that by just closing your eyes, right? The moment you start to withdraw attention from, ex, from external events and experiences, that's meditation. That's all there is to it, right? And you keep going, right? Okay, well now, okay, so now also my thoughts, right? Okay, so I, I'm looking at my thoughts. Now, this is self-inquiry and this is meditation. When you're simply looking at them without any engagement whatsoever, you're just experiencing them as they are with no intention, no agenda, no nothing. That's pure meditation. Now, that doesn't mean meditating as a way of learning how to concentrate better, to learn how to withdraw your attention, because you'll find it's not always easy to do. We're so habitually in the mind that we'll find ourselves just withdrawing. And before I know it, we're off in some story, we're engaged in something, you know, I'm sitting here now thinking about, God, I'd really love to have pancakes for breakfast tomorrow morning. And you're in the story. Wow, that would taste good. Blueberries, and fresh maple syrup. Oh, <laughs> where was I? All right, right. You, you'll, you'll notice that, but it's okay. If you simply go, oh, okay, that's what I did and bring it back. Now, inquiry simply 
does one extra thing because you can see it's it's kind of an inquiry as well, right? But you, you're just withdrawing and withdrawing and withdrawing. But then at a point, it's like you go, okay, so all of these are being seen, right? And at that point, it's, well, who am I? Now the meditation is really kind of just a state in which this self-inquiry occurs. So Ramana didn't teach the meditation per se, according to the common definition, which is still there. People say it. I talk to people about meditation, and they'll talk to you about the position and breathing and watching their breath or watching a candle or something. They, they won't talk about it the way I do. And, and so R Ramana always did exactly what I'm talking about, right? And if somebody couldn't get right there, he'd take a step back. And there were various kinds of techniques he'd, 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 um, he'd bring up. There's various, the Buddha did the same thing. He would like, just wherever somebody was, he'd come up with something that would be appropriate for them that would get them to that place where eventually there would be just this emptiness, right? And in that emptiness, with the, with the deep inquiry, who am I, which really are just the words to express the deepest desire to know myself as I actually am, right, becomes, it's where the sense of being somebody and that emptiness you're experiencing merge. The somebody disappears. I am the emptiness. I just am. Now, you can see that, that that can be a process. Less analysis, it isn't. And a lot of teachers will try to bypass a, a lot of the process things that I and other teachers will do, including my own teacher, uh, will do, and try to go directly to that by just denying this and that. I guess it works for some people. Um, it didn't work for me. <laughs> and I, I've not seen it work. I've, 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 the only time I've seen it get close is when people have already gone through a lot of, of, of practice. So um, it, in that sense, in the sense that I use the word meditation, Ramana did use it, right? In the, in the sense that most people use that, he did not, right? And the way most people use it, I don't recommend it, right? It's a distraction. It takes you off the track. At best, it will make you good at concentrating. It will give you the illusion that you've controlled your mind. Now, it will make reduce stress. It will make you more empathetic. It will make you more uh, kind. You'll be a little bit slower to anger. So it will have positive effects, but it won't get you here <laughs> because it never withdraws far enough to question the one who's actually med meditating. Who's but sitting on this cushion? And so it, it, it becomes a means of getting to that point. And at that point, it's simply the state in which the inquiry happens. And that meditation inquiry really kind of merge into just this, into the pure awareness. And who you are doesn't need meditation, doesn't need inquiry. <laughs> Why? Why would it? It's it is effortless being, but it's universal, impersonal, effortless being without being anything in particular. Pure being. Does that answer it for you, Anthony? I hope so. <laughs> right. Oh, she's still speaking about it. Mary says, "I love it as a non-denational. It's." It's is so like an arrow that pierces the armor. I'm still speaking about Eckhart book. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you for pointing that out. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. And um, I've read it. I've read. I think I've read it twice. But I mean, I read it like 20 years ago, right? Maybe more. Uh, yes. Yeah. I think it was that long ago. It was quite a while ago. Um, and um, I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't now, right? I don't need those pointers anymore. But they're the most perfect pointers for many, many, many people. And to see something like that, uh, a book like *The Power of Now*, which is essentially non-dual, and he's essentially a non-dual teacher, um, 
resonate with so many people in so many walks of life um, is just, it's all how the message comes. <laughs> and if you get on Oprah, that helps. <laughs> Why doesn't she invite me to Super Soul Sunday? I just don't get it. Ah, jeez. Angela. Uh, while it is freeing to realize everything is my meanings and to realize what is real, a part of me feels the terror there's actually nothing to hold on to. As I had thought, it feels as if the body reacts to the instability of there's no ground to stand on. Um, there's no, there's, there is a solid ground to stand on. Of course there is. Of course there is. If there was no ground whatsoever, right, everything would be relative. It would mean nothing exists at all. It would be nihil nihilism, right? And I saw that you made this comment on YouTube, and I was going to, I was hoping you would bring it to uh, satsang today, Angela. Um, so, what we're doing is just we are breaking down all the places where we thought there was ground and there wasn't. <laughs> okay. We we're 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 exposing all the places that we were building on jello and thought we were building on concrete, on solid, on solid rock, right? And so and now as that happens, because we've assumed that it's that it's solid and we begin to realize that it isn't. Yeah. We're going to feel as if, where do I stand? Where do I stand? Right. And then we may find another place to stand for a while. And that that's okay. It, the, you know, we're not here to throw, <laughs> to throw the, the nervous system into terror. Right. I, I'm not here to give it, give anybody the shakes. Right you're going to take from this step to this step. I mean, and it's okay. So, okay. Oh, I'm, I'm not really that. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to be, I'm going to have, be more spiritual. I'm going to be more disciplined. I'm going to do these kinds of things. Now they're, they're not the ultimate, right? But they will give some foundation. They'll give some stability in the moment. And that's perfectly all right. right? Now realizing that I've given all these things, the meaning, right? Does it mean that I'm totally unstable because they don't have the meaning? That means you've only gone halfway there. Right? The meaning, right? where is the meaning arising from? What gave it meaning? And if it gave it meaning, then it has the meaning to give. Oh, so it isn't as if there's no meaning. It means the meaning has been projected on that, and that doesn't have it. I do. That's when the ground gets solid, doesn't it? Because it's not something out there that you're trying to... Now, it can feel unstable because you have to let go of where you thought it was, but take it the rest of the way. Oh, it came from me. I'm the solid ground. <laughs> right? So it's not like there is no ground to stand on. I'm the ground to stand on. And yes, the, the teacher, and they love to do this in Zen, um, will pull the rug out from underneath you, right? Like, like that. Simply because it wants you to land on solid ground, right? Push you off the cliff. It's not you're going to fall forever. You're going to land softly on solid ground. Because you are that solid ground. So it's not there's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing to hold to on out there. <laughs> right? There's everything to hold on in here. Because it is the substance of all things. This within you is what actually does exist. Meister Eckert called it the ground of being. The ground of being, which he said, which got him into trouble, both the both man and God both emerged from this one singular ground of being. Got a lot of trouble. <laughs> they didn't touch him because he was so popular, but but the church wanted to 
wanted to get get rid of him, and they did actually try him for heresy after he died. <laughs> so, Angela, you are the ground of being. This is what we don't get. We go, well, where do I find it, right? And as long as that's going on, we're going to be looking at it somewhere. The only place everywhere it isn't. The I is the ground of being. It is that which is unshakable, right? And, and just ponder that for a second. The eye is always there. You project it meaning here and then over here, different meaning there, all these things are there. Then this changes and this is unstable. Isn't the eye that's been engaging the whole time always been there? Hasn't it always been absolutely rock solid? We've just thought that the stability was somewhere other than myself. <laughs> you are it. <laughs> and that's that's and that's why the rug has to keep be, being pulled out from under you until you fall all the way down and go, oh, it's me. I gave it meaning. So I have the meaning. I'm as solid as they get. <laughs> this eye is unshakable. It's unmovable. It can't be touched, can't be harmed. And it's effortless. I didn't even make this eye. It's just here. And it's always been here. It, it's not even in time. <laughs> Is that helping? Is that helping, my dear friend? <laughs> my dear friend in Malaysia. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're good. Oh, geez, getting hungry. I haven't eaten today. Ebolia says, different forms of freedom is my meaning I am giving to it. It's a perception of me. You speak, my name is Ebo, Eboja, Eboja. Ah, thanks for your explanation. Yes, and obviously this freedom has come up a great, great deal today. Um, and I think that's what I was talking about with you before. Let me go back and make sure. Um, yes. Yes, it was. Uh, 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 right. Different forms. Of, yes. Right. But you are the freedom. That's what I keep coming back to. You are the source of all. Everything that you've given, every attribute you've attributed to something else can only be attributed because you've got it. It's you. You have it. <laughs> I do not much clearer, you may, but your mind won't grasp this. It goes, yeah, 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 I get it. And, and where is it again? Because, because the mind cannot accept that it's already here. Why? Because the moment that's accepted, the mind ceases to exist. It, its whole purpose for being has been to seek the truth. If you are the truth, its purpose for being is finished. Now it'll be relegated to balancing checkbooks and, you know, I mean, giving expression I mean, it's not as perfunctory as that. The mind becomes the vehicle through which you get to give this expression. Right? It can become eloquent and, and articulate. Right? And will only be used when it's needed. <laughs> it won't be the go-to job. It won't be the, you know, the, the only tool in the toolbox. Right? It, will have, it will have served uh, it, its purpose. It, it will have yield to higher reasoning, which will yield to, to the ultimate knowing. Mm. Merck, good to see you. Good to see you. Anthony said, yes, thank you. Good, 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 good. Mary says, I'm rereading it, and wow, I'm seeing it ever so more deeper. This is my second time to read it. Yeah, well, now, yes. Now that you've been more exposed to non-dual teachings, you, you'll get where he's coming from. You'll un, you'll, you basically understand the, the mind of Eckhart, which wrote the book, <laughs> right? And you'll see that you're coming from the same place, right? And that your life is expressing it in a way totally unique. And you know, maybe someday he'll read your book. <laughs> Emil, or Emil, how to step back from thoughts. Are you a new Emil? I don't recognize the name. Um, how to step back from thoughts. Feels like I'm stuck in the mind 
and trying to find out how to come out, how to see that I'm not that I who is stuck. And at the same time, it's a lot of pressure in the body and the attention to go there. Yes, all of, all of which is so. Now, let's just kind of slow down and break it down. Because right? what you did was you, you presented an idea of the solution before you even stated what the problem is, right? <laughs> so how do I step back from the thoughts, right? How do I do this? Which means, okay, the answer to what I'm about to ask you is that I need to step back from thoughts, right? Uh, and I must do that because it feels like I'm stuck in the mind and trying to find out how to come out, right? how to see that I'm not that I who is stuck. And at the same time, it's a lot of pressure in the body. So let, let's go direct to experience now first, right? Drop any idea of what the solution is, okay? Let's just put that aside. It, maybe stepping back from thoughts isn't what you need to do. Wouldn't that be interesting, right? So just drop that solution and just notice how that feels. Oh, suddenly there's an openness, right? Oh, maybe it's... Maybe it's easy. Maybe it's way easier. <laughs> okay? So, there's a feeling of being stuck. Right? There's a feeling. Now, go to that feeling and even put aside that word st stuck, right? Because that's the mind interpreting this feeling. And now just be with the feeling. There's this feeling. And I'm going to have to use words so I, you know, we can communicate. There's this feeling, which you say is a feeling of being stuck. And then trying this other feeling of trying to get out of the stuckness. Right? All right, so what if that feeling isn't stuckness at all? What if it's a misinterpretation? Right? You know, just play with it for, for a second. It, maybe it may not. Right? But I, I want you to set aside all your ideas about this feeling and just be with the feeling itself, the feeling of, of whatever it is, and then the wanting to get away from that feeling. Right? And notice how your mind has decided, I've got to get out of my thoughts, and I've got to, I've got to come out of this. Right? And how do I see that this is not who I am? Right? Which is basically, you know, that I'm not the one who is stuck. <laughs> and I'm also feeling all this pressure in the body. Now, is this pressure and these feelings, these sensations in the body, are, are they different from that, the feeling you, you, you defined as being stuck? Okay, just, just stay with it for a second. Right? We're not in a hurry here. we got plenty of time. Right? Let's just really explore this. And I, I invite everybody to do this, right? Because we all have this feeling, right? That somehow I'm stuck here. I just can't, I'm just not getting it, right? I, I want to be awake. I want to be enlightened. I want to be free, right? I gotta be free. I gotta, right? I want that, okay? We all have that, right? So let's just be with that feeling, right? Something that feels constrained. Right? And not, let's not put any label on it whatsoever, right? You recognize the feeling. The, the feeling, it's got a particular energetic signature to it, right? So just be present with it. No thought of trying to get rid of it, right? Let's not make it into an enemy. Now there's a feeling there. Now, now what if we never had the thought that said, this feeling is a problem. How do I get out of it? What if that thought never occurred to you? Would it be a problem? Would you need to know how to step back from thoughts? Do you know how to find it come out of it? Notice that the mind is, is creating a problem and then trying to find a solution to the problem it created. But ignorant of the fact that it created the problem by calling it a problem, it blames this feeling that's there. <laughs> no, it's his fault. <laughs> he did it. <laughs> the feeling's at what? I'm just here. I'm just a feeling. What? 
Don't do nothing. It's just sitting there. It's just a feeling, right? It, and it didn't come and announce itself as a problem, did it? So great, we're just setting aside all of the extra chatter. And you notice that your the mind has even appropriated some non-dual ideas, like how do I see that I'm not the I who is stuck, right? And you can see that, well, yeah, it's that's we'll get there, right? But you can see how the mind is just trying to use this to create this, <laughs> this thing going on. And just that, all by itself, it's just a feeling, right? That has no meaning unless I give it to it. And the meaning I gave it was, it's a problem. Oh, okay. I withdraw that, Your Honor. <laughs> Objection sustained. All right. Now it's just a feeling. Notice, it's being just a feeling. You just notice this space opening up and going, Oh my God. Oh, it's just a feeling. And then you can see very subtly there's a problem. And then there's and then there's somebody who's got to deal with the problem. Right? Can you see that that's the eye that's stuck? As if I'm an eye, I have to deal with this problem. I need this problem to be the I. <laughs> oh. Just by seeing it as a, as just a feeling, I have now come out of the I that needs to get out of it. There is no I that needs to get out of it. I'm not in it. That was just an idea, a thought, a pattern that I accepted as true. Oh, I'm not in it. I've never been in it in the first place. So I don't have to come out of it. Now, notice the pressure in your body. What's happening to that? <laughs> You've just seen that you're not that I. You've never been that I, right? But the I was created when the mind said, this is a problem. Now it's got to make a solution. And now there's a person who has a problem and they're working this out. And how do I step back from thoughts? You just did. <laughs> you don't just step back. From, I don't want that thought. I don't want that thought. You step back by understanding, right? Understanding that thought is secondary and that there's just an experience that happens. And then the mind gives it meaning and interpretation and create somebody to deal with the meaning that it created in the first place. You go all the way to the root and go, it has no meaning. It's just a feeling. All of a sudden, it's like, the whole thing collapses. The mind's gone. The one who's stuck is gone. The stuckness is gone. And whatever that energy is, is free to do whatever it needs to do. Right? It's every energy that comes up, every energy that comes up has its own destiny. Let it fulfill it. Mind interpret. I don't like it. I, I want this feeling. I don't want that feeling. There's no such thing as a as a feeling that's bad or good. They're all neutral. They're just feelings. <laughs> and all the rest is just this this mind stuff, right? That is um, that's completely imaginary, right? How you doing, Emil? Did we get it? Let me know, Marie. C oh god C L L C C C C I can't pronounce your name. I love to because Italian so beautiful. Uh, love to all of you from Italy. Thank you so much, GP, for your generous, loving sharing. My pleasure. I love to do it. Angela, thank you. I do get that the self is the ground. It's just an unfamiliar way of being. So it's not established yet, and in many ways the mind is still playing its tricks. Yeah, and every time it plays a trick, you get stronger. Y your feet sink into that concrete. <laughs> the, those, those pylons that hold the building up go even more, even more deeply. And just notice that it's just a feeling that's coming up, right? I'm unstable. It's going to be unstable. It's like, no, it's not. 
I'm the stability. Right? You're not. So yeah, shake around a bit. It's okay. It's okay. It's like, you know, like a little kid. Oh, no, no, I'm scared. It's okay. Come to mom. All right. It's all right. It's all right. No problem. Are you ready to do it now? Yeah. And off, off to the slide they go. I mean, you know, my daughter, what loves to, my gr granddaughter loves to, you know, jump around on the bars and then she'll fall, right? And she'll try something and she'll fall, you know, five, six feet, you know, she's, you know, little. <laughs> where, where, yeah, I'll hold her. We go up on the side and we'll just sit there where she cries for a while. And you go, okay. You want to try it again? Yeah. And up she goes, you know, this time she makes it. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, she'll fall again. <laughs> it, 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 regard all of these things with that level of humor and of compassion, right? All these feelings and stuff, you know, if you regard them as like rescue dogs or, you know, scared little kids, they won't seem nearly as, <laughs> as significant. They won't seem so powerful and overwhelming. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, and notice that the, the mind, the, the, remember, yes, so the mind is playing its tricks. I always like to bring attention back to this. There's no mind playing tricks. It's not an entity that's out to get you. Any more than Siri is an entity out to get you, right? If Siri says, I'm sorry, I don't know that, right? There's no I there. So mind is simply a word to designate patterns of thought. Nothing more, okay? Nothing more, just a pattern of thought. And because we have gone along with these patterns of thought and not scrutinized them, they pop up and appear to be playing tricks on us, right? But when you pop up and you go, oh, there it is again. There's the mind and I'm not trickable anymore. Right, And so we can refer to the mind as playing tricks, but what it really is are simply thought patterns that have not yet been scrutinized. That's it, right? So there's nobody out to get you. <laughs> there's no devil. There's no Lucifer, right? <laughs> Nobody's... <laughs> oh, Angela. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Mary says, yes, he says exactly what you said about those who read his books. Yeah, yeah. Well... We speak from the same place, he and I. <laughs> yeah, he's just been on Oprah and I haven't. <laughs> Creative Revolution. Hello, Susanna. Hello, beautiful G. Hello, beautiful Susanna. Ida, same to you, love. Hello from Germany. Hello, Facebook user from Germany who whose identity shall remain a secret, and a covert operation. <laughs> Wonderful to have you. Okay, GP, help me here. Are our feelings not telling us that something we believe is either right or wrong, right or wrong for ourselves? Uh, oh, you would bring that up, wouldn't you? Okay. Again, the answer is yes and, and no. Um, but in order for, as I, as I point out, our, our feelings and our sensations are direct, right? Feelings and sensations are, are not interpretive, you know? The feeling doesn't come up and say, I'm a bad feeling or I'm a good feeling. It doesn't identify itself like that. It's, it's just what it is, right? And as such, it exists in the, in the timeless now. It is completely and totally um, uh, interacting with the environment in that moment. So from that perspective, it, there, there's truth in it, right? Now, the mind, on the other hand, is always interpretive. It's always the past and the future. It's never in the present moment. It's always reacting to the present moment. And, and then imposing meaning and interpretation and significance to it. It gives it its importance and then determines what we're going to do about it, how we're going to react to that. So when I, when I do something like I, like I just did with Emil, we go directly to the, to, the, to the sensation itself and remove all the overhead. 
At, at that point, one of two things will happen. It, it will either it will either dissolve, right? Because that's all it needed was the space to, to free itself. Or it, it will begin to morph, right? Um, it, it may move. It may move in the body. It may change forms. It may do all sorts of things. And our job, though, is to stay with it as it is, right? So if there is something for it that it needs us to, to, uh, to, to share with us, right, it can. And that's what the inquiry is. Right when when it, when the sensation is just there and and it doesn't budge right or it's just kind of transforming at that point we inquire and the inquiry is just very gentle it's compassion what are you here for what are you protecting me from y y there's no such thing as a sensation that isn't here for a reason but what's important is and this is the heart and soul of inner reconciliation which I highly recommend to everyone you're you are going directly to the sensation itself to find out what that purpose is. As long as we're in the mind uh, analyzing it, it will be our assumptions about that feeling. And there are always going to be some variation on how to get rid of it. <laughs> They're never going to be, I want to stay with it and, and have it tell me what it, it wants to, to say. It, the, because the mind always assumes it knows and then it tries to impose itself on the feeling. This is, this is my big complaint with self-help. That's what it does. And, and psychoanalysis that doesn't have an enlightened practitioner. I've got a lot of psychoanalysis as students that have become enlightened psychoanalysts, <laughs> that, that actually, the, the psychotherapists, that, that actually that use psychotherapy to get to that pure experience of the, of the feeling. When the mind is out of it, Right, and we're and we are just being completely present with the feeling as it is. It now has the space to reveal itself, to dissolve, to do whatever it needs to do. You're no longer fighting it, and you're no longer imposing any kind of meaning or anything onto it. You are actively asking it, "Why are you here?" Every feeling, every you know, every cell in your body is a living being. <laughs> it has a life cycle. It has a purpose. And it fulfills that purpose and it dissolves, it, it died. The energy goes back into making something else, right? Our feelings, our sensations, our moments, all of this is the same thing. They all have a purpose for being there. Being in emotional distress or physical pain or whatever it might be, there's a reason it's there, right? And sometimes all it needs is the space, right? where it's free to move and it will dissolve. It's gone. It's done. It, that's all it needed. Other times it needs more, right? It does need to tell you something. And so you'll hear me say a lot with people as I'm working with them, talking to the energy. If there's something you want to say, I'm listening. Otherwise, it's up to you, right? And some of the stuff that can come up is out there. <laughs> really st stuff so very strange. You know, and stuff from past lives, right? That had nothing to do with the life. And it's obvious, but that was the energy that was trapped in whatever way that needed self-expression. And once it did that, the energy was now freed. All that energy went whoop, into out of self-protection and into self-expression. Uh, uh, and so, you know, when Eckhart Tolle refers to the pain body, notice he's not taking an antagonistic position towards it. He's just identifying for what it is, this energy that needs to feed, right? right. So if you, if, you, if you are present with it, right, but not feeding it what it wants, right, it gets what it needs, which is love. That's what it really needs. That's what it always is, right? And so from there, you, you're, you're right. There's no judgment on the feeling now and it will reveal what it needs and and it will it will dispel old traumas and then those feelings really begin to merge with intuition and they begin to instead of reflecting old traumas and patterns and wounds and the like they they become what they really are which is the intimate and immediate connection to the environment which means that whatever you're feeling 
because it's no longer burdened by old stuff, is, is accurately uh, responding to the environment, and therefore you can trust it as being accurate. So that when, you know, I've come to trust those feelings enough that when I'm, I'm speaking, either to, either to a group, either online or in person, or in a, in a session, or even here, I know what people are feeling because I'm feeling it. And, and that's, you know, it's not, it's not psychic or anything like that. It's not my mind reading. It's just I, tr I've trust, I trust the feelings now, right? I, I trust they're resonating with the whole environment, which is revealing to me what's here, right? This is the, the connection I have literally to the whole universe. Because <laughs> ultimately, the, your, the universe is your body. It, it appears to be localized here, right? But that's just a concept, right? Can you separate the body from the environment? Can you separate the plants from the ground, from the from the light, from the the carbon dioxide uh, that they're breathing in? Can I separate myself from the plants? I, I need them <laughs> without the plants, and uh, uh, I I can't breathe. Okay? It, it's just you you see that this is one functioning and 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 now f feelings become trustworthy because they're not distorted anymore right they're they're free to come and go as they please and that's exactly what they do they come they report they're gone done right <laughs> and, and and so they're not they're not something that's there there are they are they're literally consciousness aware of the truth and you see that what regarded as an as a as a uh, as an other, namely my feelings, aren't another at all. They're they're the dynamic aspect of consciousness. They're constant. They're they're the pure, absolute, vibrating as form, which is everything in your experience. Ah, great song, song says, ja, thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> Susanna's going to fix the Oprah. <laughs> thank you, Susanna. If anybody can do it, it's you. David and Elaine, thanks for another razor sharp satsang, cutting through misunderstandings of the truth of our being. Oh, I love you two guys. I love you guys. Thank you, David and Elaine. Emil, thanks. It feels lighter in my head, but it's a pressure in my breast and my lower back, and I feel nervous. Okay. All right, good. And, and when I say good, I say, oh, yeah, it's a great feeling. What I mean is don't do everything you can to let go of your resistance to those feelings. And, and, and you can see the way that the mind is saying they shouldn't be here. Well, if they shouldn't be here, they wouldn't. I, I always assume that when something is happening, it's supposed to be happening. And I know it's supposed to be happening because it's happening. I assume that what is happening is what's supposed to be happening. So take the pressure off yourself to know what it is, to, to get to the root of it, to do anything at all. Take all the pressure off and just go, oh, yeah, okay, my head's lighter. Let's just let let's just kind of let that lightness come down here into my into my breast, my my, my chest, my and and to my lower back and my whole body. And just open up and say, what is it you need to tell me? Up to and including nothing at all. And, and I'm just listening. And I accept that you're here and that you need to be here. And I give you full permission to be here. And um, I, I realize that there's some resistance. I really don't want to feel this way. But I acknowledge that. And I acknowledge that you're here. And um, I'm willing to reconcile with all of that. If you know how to do EFT, you can do EFT while you do that for a little bit. Not too much, just kind of like, I call it presence tapping, just using it to help the body kind of sink in and, and let go of the resist, resistance to it. Right? And, and, and when you do that, you'll find that the suffering, even, if, even the feelings themselves, which may even become more intense, there'll be less suffering as you become more and more curious about them and less resistant to them, 
the the pain begins to diminish. Right. So wonderful, Emil. Wonderful, Mary. Beautiful. Thank you, GP. Thank you, Great Side. You're welcome, Ava. Thank you, GP, for today. Whatever you're saying here lands inside without any question or doubt. <laughs> it's always a wonderful experience. Ah. It lands in there without question or doubt because it's coming from there. Uh, David, ah, sneaking one in on me at the end. <laughs> GP, when you said your mind is not an entity out to get you, that's how religion makes it seem. Yes, to be completely in fear of yourself. Not only religion does that, but a lot of spirituality does. I've got to get rid of the mind. A lot of misguided meditation. I've got to quiet the mind, make the mind shut up. Um, without understanding what it is. And it it is simply, again, the way the mind function works, the way thought processes work, is they create what are called abstractions. right? And so it's just this fluid flowing of thoughts. But when I'm talking to you, I just can't say the fluid flowing of thoughts, right? Because it's a moving thing. It's like trying to, what's a river? We call it the Mississippi, but what is it? It's like it's just this constant flow of water. We call it wind, but it's just all the air moving, right? But the moment I give it a name, I kind of concretize it. I, it's, like I, I, it's like I photograph it now, and it becomes a thing. That's an abstraction. And mind works that way, and it's good. So I can say mind, and we can talk about it. Right, But of course, here's what happens. Once it becomes a concrete thing, and that's what an abstraction is, it becomes a, a, a mental object. It begins to become a thing that it gets thoughts about, and it gets interpretation, and it has meaning, and has an identity. And the mind starts making stories up about that. And so now the mind becomes this entity that's messing up my life and it's, it's the devil incarnate and it's, it's doing horrible things to me and I've got to purify my mind to see God or I've got to, I've got to, I've got to focus my attention so I can manifest a new car, right? And, all, and what you're doing is you, basically you're giving medicine to a ghost. What is it that the mind is? Well, it's a word. <laughs> it's a word that's become divorced from what the word originally meant. And it's taken on a life of its own, a completely fictional life of its own, right? It's got no more reality to it than Darth Vader, right? We can talk about Darth Vader, right? But it's a completely fictional character. Mind is a fictional character. So if you take all of that away from it, right, all the extra over overhead and say, okay, what was it originally? What was it to, to represent? This is what Ramana Harshi means by going back the way you came. Through the abstractions, back to what was it? Oh, it was a flow of thoughts. Oh, a flow of thoughts. And thoughts, like everything else in the universe, form patterns. And this pattern is something that's kind of in ground and it happens until I see it as a pattern. And in the seeing of it, the pattern begins to dissolve. When I don't see it, I can see it as a trickster, right? Which is just another word, right? It's the trickster God. It's the trickster mind, right? But what is it? it it's a flow of thoughts, a particular pattern of thoughts that I hadn't noticed before that kept coming up and grabbing my attention that I had, I had ideas about what it was. And, oh, wait a minute. It isn't that at all. It's just this pattern of thought that I haven't looked at. Now I'm looking at it and I go, oh, there's nothing tricking me. I tricked myself by believing it to be. I tricked my damn self. <laughs> so there's my my little exposition on the on the mind to uh, to bring this bring this to a close today. So thank you all for joining me. Thank you for being here. It's always uh, always the high point of my week. I love you all so much. Until mm, till next time. Namaste. <laughs>